some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn now to uh, the highly acclaimed novelist Russell Banks. His new novel explores the plight of sex offenders trying to live among us as outcasts. Banks is a two-time Pulitzer finalist who's written a dozen novels and several short story collections. He's known for drawing on his working-class background to write about criminals and outcasts. In his past novels, such as Cloud Splitter, he focused on revolutionary abolitionist John Brown, and his novel Affliction revolved around a paranoid alcoholic. His book Rule of the Bone was about a 14-year-old drug dealer, both Affliction and Sweet hereafter were adapted into feature films. I recently spoke with Russell Banks and started by asking him about his new novel, Lost Memory of Skin, about a 22-year-old homeless man known as The Kid, who lives with a group of convicted sex offenders under a causeway in Florida. I, I live um, about half the year uh, in Miami Beach, uh, and um, from my from the terrace of my apartment, I could look out on the causeway, the Julia Tuttle Causeway, which connects the um, the mainland Miami to uh, Miami Beach. And about four years ago, articles started appearing in the um, Miami Herald about a colony. It really can't call it much else than that. Um, of, of men who were convicted sex offenders uh, who had served their time um, and then were dropped off with the connivance of the local uh, law authorities um, and parole officers and so forth um, underneath this bridge and were living there. Uh, they couldn't live, as you said, anywhere within 2,500 feet of where children gathered, which essentially meant there was no place in the city for them to live. So there they were clustered together in this squalid encampment. And I could look out and see it, and I just started wondering. What on earth is going on? This, you talk about the unintended consequences of good intentions or blowback, and here we have it on a very domestic uh, level. Uh, because here we're, um, yes, uh, psychopathic serial rapists right alongside uh, some poor old drunk who got caught urinating in a parking lot and was convicted of indecent exposure, which is a sex crime. And, or a kid who had had sex with his, uh, I mean, a 21 or 20-year-old kid who had had sex with his high school girlfriend who was under 18 which is statutory rape, and they were all being lumped together, um, thrown into a heap there. And I just started being drawn into the—I mean, what a novelist does is try to inhabit someone else's life and, and look out on the world from that point of view. And I just could imagine this kid, um, who becomes the kid in the novel, a 22-year-old loser, the kind of kid who kind of slides through life slightly alienated. and. Um, caught up in the internet and pornography and lost in a kind of dreamscape uh, that between, especially regarding his erotic life, between reality and, and fantasy, and, um, and getting caught, um, Served in the crossing military. a line, serving in the military and then getting bounced out of the military. And, um, a lonely soul, uh, uh, without contact with the real world, um, but not psychotic by any means, not mentally ill even, um, but uh, confused, lost. Uh, there are many ways to describe kids like that, and there are millions of them. Uh, more and more. And then um, police raid the encampment. The, in the story, the kids, uh, the, 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 yeah, the encampment gets raided, and, and another character appears, and here a professor of sociology, an outsized character, I mean, literally outsized, weighs a quarter of a ton, and, and um, a man who lives in his head. And for whom his body has kind of disappeared in somewhat the same way the kid's body has disappeared, although the kid's has become digitalized, as it were, and, and the professor's body is, is uh, lost in, in, in his gluttony and, and his obsession with food and so forth. And he's uh, an intellectual who has theories about everything, and, and his, uh, his intention is to kind of save the kid and, and to test his theories with regarding uh, with regard to um, pedophilia or sex offenses and, and so forth. And then there's the journalist. And uh, later, yes, there is the writer, right? Oh. <laughs> yes, he appears. Excuse me. Yes, yes, right. The writer appears later. And then there's the wife and the characters. And then there are all these pseudonyms that the characters under the bridge take on. There's the shyster and the rabbit and so forth, Paco and Fruit Loops and the Greek. And, and 
And in a way, they're like trolls living under a bridge. And I wanted to bring the story up out of Miami's specific mundane reality of Miami, while still making it realistic, and bring it up into the level of fable, so that it could apply elsewhere, and not just be a story about Miami, but about the rest of the country, and maybe even the rest of the West in some ways. But, but make it more universal, or more nearly universal, because it is an interesting and a um, tragic in many ways plight. Um, uh, what do you do with convicted sex offenders? We do make gradations when we convict them, you know, for a second or third class crime, depending on the seriousness of it, violence, if that was involved, and so forth. But after they're out, they're stuck on um, the National Sex Register, uh, National Sex Offender Registry forever. Um, they have usually long periods of parole, 10 periods, 10 years where they're wearing a, an anklet, an electronic anklet, where they're under surveillance, essentially. And then in some places now, um, they're trying to extend beyond time served, uh, make it a permanent condition, a lifetime condition. I mean, we're, we're just not dealing with the social, psychological, um, political realities. And increasingly, uh, homelessness, uh, um, the population of, of homeless people in cities like New York or anywhere else in America uh, are being um, filled with convicted sex offenders who can't live anywhere. Did you go to the encampment? Yeah, I walked over, because uh, I could walk from my place, uh, and um, talk to some of these guys. The kind of research—I'm a novelist, not a social scientist or, or a historian uh, or an investigative journalist, so I wanted to know, what does it smell like? Um, what is it like with the sound of vehicles rumbling overhead 24 hours a day? Um, what's it uh, look like, you know, with the bay right there and the water coming up at high tide and so forth? and just get a sense of it. Then I did a lot of the usual kinds of research as well, you know, where you you read and uh, and legal uh, um, history and, and psychological uh, analysis and speculation and so forth uh, into, into the subject. We're talking to Russell Banks. His new book is Lost Memory of Skin. Uh, talk about the title. Well, I think that I wanted the title to uh, direct us to the erasure of uh, the hard line which has existed for so long between fantasy and reality, especially when it comes to our erotic lives, our sexual lives. Um, and the erasure that seems to me to have occurred over the last particularly at an accelerated rate over the last decade or so with the digitalization of our erotic life. And, um, and, in, 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 and as a result of that, um, we seem to have lost uh, the kind of skin connection we have to other human beings. And, and, and instead, we've become increasingly self-referential with regard to our erotic connections. And because the digitalization of it means, of course, is pointing to pornography and, and the easy, easy access of it. In fact, the difficulty of escaping from it um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the eroticizing of consumer goods, um, and therefore of consumer goods per users, like children, um, and, 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 and how they, I think, oddly feed each other. Um, and um, it's a phenomenon that uh, you may remember a couple of weeks ago, People magazine had a big piece on the front about t children with tiaras and beauty contests and so forth. Well, that's just another example of it, uh, uh, of this phenomenon. You set yourself a very difficult task, because you're taking the most unsympathetic characters mm -hmm. in society. Mm -hmm. um, you are taking sex offenders, mm -hmm. and yet you, by meeting them, are showing us all that they do. This, like the kid, mm -hmm. uh, this young man uh, who's 22 years old, um, continually in trying to get a job, for example, he has to see, is there a school around? Is there a movie theater around? Mm -hmm. is, there a li is he allowed into a library? He has to ask. Yeah. And anyone being able to check mm -hmm. the registry. Mm -hmm. So you're taking on the most difficult task. Yeah, and it's a taboo subject. It's one we don't want to think about. Um, we uh, would just as soon it went away somehow. And, and um, so when you bring it back up into a novel, you're also bringing up 
you hope that the the reader um, will feel some of the same affection and sympathy for this character as as I do, as the author does. Um, it is a risk, I suppose. But you know, I, I didn't think about it until now. I mean, in a funny way, as uh, well, while writing the book, I was just simply following my own deep personal curiosity and need to understand a, a life very, very different from my own. Once the book enters the public world, of course, then I have to consider the fact, well, probably not everybody has the same curiosity and interest uh, and desire to understand that, that I do. And you hope the kid is sympathetic. And, uh, you know, he's funny, he's honest, he's basically honest and decent, and he wants to be a good person um, and is trying very hard. He's also ashamed and guilty. And a good deal of his effort in the earlier parts of the book is to try to separate out shame and guilt, because he's internalized society's view of him as, a, uh, as someone who is beneath any kind of civil um, or personal consideration. I wanted to go back uh, to one of your earlier books that was made into a film, um, The Sweet Hereafter. The novel tells the story of the impact on a small town of a tragic school bus accident that killed many of the town's children. In this scene, the father of two of the children confronts an aggressive trial lawyer who's shown up in town to organize the families of the victims into a lawsuit. The confrontation is interrupted by a call from the lawyer's adult daughter, a homeless drug addict. I can help you. Not unless you can raise the dead. Here, you may change your mind. Mitchell Stevens, Esquire. Tell me, would you be likely to sue me if I was to beat you right now? I mean, beat you so bad you blood and couldn't walk for a month. Because that's what I'm about to do. No, Mr. Ansel. I'm going to sue you. You leave us alone, Stevens. You leave the people of this town alone. You can't help. You can help each other. Several people in the town have agreed to let me represent them in a negligence suit. Now, your case as an individual will be stronger if I'm allowed to represent you together as a group. Case? The workers have agreed. The others have agreed. Nicole Bernal's parents. It's important that we initiate proceedings right away. Things get covered up. People lie. That's why we must begin our investigation quickly before the evidence disappears. That's what I'm doing out here. Listen, you. I know Risa and Wendell Walker. They wouldn't hire a lawyer. The autos, they wouldn't deal with you. We're not country bumpkins. You can put the big city hustle on. You're angry, Mr. Ansel. And you owe it to yourself to feel that way. All I'm saying is, let me direct your rage. That's my daughter. Or it may be the police that told me they found her dead. She's a drug addict. Why are you telling me this? Why am I telling you this, Mr. Ansel? I'm... Because we've all lost our children. They're dead to us. They're killing each other in the streets. They wander comatose shopping malls. up. It's taken our children away. It's too late. They're gone. Russell Banks, in your novel, The Sweet Hereafter, um, as in your latest novel, A Lost Memory of Skin, you write about lost childhood. Can you talk about this recurrent theme in your writing? You're right, it does. It comes again. Rule of the bone is really about that. And I'm not sure. I think I'm drawn to, again and again, the, the, the story of, of 
the lost child, the abandoned child, maybe more of the case. The child is not simply lost from home. There is no home uh, in most of these cases. Um, perhaps uh, I endured a version of that myself as a child. Um, but Where did you grow up? In New Hampshire and eastern Massachusetts, in a broken family. My father abandoned uh, the family when I was about 12, and, and uh, I was the oldest of four. My mother raised us from there. Um, but I think more recently, I mean, in the recent years, more uh, since I went along in adulthood, um, I've become increasingly aware of um, of something that's species deep, it seems to me, having been abandoned, and that's the, the, the need to protect um, the weakest among us who are always children, the most vulnerable among us. And in the last half century, I'm old enough so I can remember the last half century pretty well, there seems to have been a shift away from that impulse, where we've given it up somehow, or we've, it's, uh, we've been seduced away from that responsibility now over several generations. You know, all those old jokes about um, keeping a salesman out of the uh, out of the house, you know, where you slam the door on his foot and he comes in over the transom, you close the transom, he comes through the window, you close the window. Um, they, they're describing a deep impulse, which is to protect um, the children against the amoral forces of nature. I mean, maybe it's climate, saber-toothed tiger in the tribe over the hill. Well, the amoral forces of nature now really are the consumer economy. And, um, and when we allow the salesman to come through the door and sit down in the living room, um, we've abandoned that responsibility to protect the home from that force of nature. And then when we take the salesman in and put it in the bedroom and make it a babysitter for the kids, we've really turned the kids over to the salesman and to the consumer economy. And th that phenomenon, to me, is a powerfully it's a very important and, and altering um, phenomenon, one that has taken place gradually, slowly, over several generations. And I think the, the abandoned children, the lost children, in some way reflect all that. As George Gervner, the founder of the Cultural Environment Movement, said, he was the former dean of the Annenberg School of Communications, about uh, corporations and children. Um, we have turned our children over to corporations who have nothing to tell and everything to sell that That's are right. raising our That's children right. today. Exactly. Yeah, and it's brilliant for marketing purposes because children replace themselves. You know, you sell one group of kids, uh, one group of 11 year old sneakers, and then next year there's a whole new bunch of 11 year olds who need sneakers, and you just keep on moving. Novelist Russell Banks, author of The Sweet Hereafter, his new book is Lost Memory of Skin. We'll come back to our interview with him in 30 seconds.